Okay, this is part B of the uh, introduction to cloud computing and data engineering, a mix of uh, clouds and applications to big data. And I'm Jeffrey Fox, and we're at part B. All right, so part B is the first uh, real section of the uh, introduction. The part A was a summary of, this, of, of what we were going to do, and it is some first. Uh, Remarks on what a cloud is. Obviously, we need to do that, and um, we give uh, basic definitions of the cloud, the things that it has to do, elasticity, on them, on and so on, interactive, and then a couple of simple examples. Uh, then we make uh, some remarks. We'll expand later on about how clouds are positioned with respect to HPC and um, Supercomputers. We uh, note the importance of multi-core. It's the fact that there are these lots of cores that we need to have technologies that use them, and we describe some aspects of a typical data center, which again we'll get into more detail later on. Okay, so here is a sort of cosmic slide of where I sit in the world, uh, and this is actually slightly biased from my background, which. Lives in the world where supercomputers are important. Um, if you were in charge of uh, making breakfast cereal, you wouldn't think so much about that. But anyway, I'm not. So supercomputers are very important. Uh, they run large-scale simulations like designing the new battery or the new fusion reactions. And um, they will both do these large simulations and actually a lot of other applications which are not so large. What I call an HPC cloud or a next generation commodity system is like what you see today in the leading edge clouds, which will have um, a mix of technologies. They will merge clouds, HPC, the support of edge, back end services, um, databases, and so on. They'll tend to be federated, there'll be a collection of resources around the world. They'll all live in giant data centers because those offer um, economies of scale, and they'll offer all types of computings: accelerated, unaccelerated, I/O dominated, I/O weak, and so on. Uh, there will be a lot of distributed data because the world is bringing the data to the cloud, and those uh, distributed data sources will be. Often associated with things or devices of the Internet of Things. And they'll have local computing, which is called the FOG, which uh, do the initial uh, processing. We are seeing um, a new um, style of computing emerge called serverless or server hidden computing, and uh, a programming model called function as a service. And that's meant to make the user happy, because it's easier to program that, you don't have to mess around. A good motto here is that no server is easier to manage than having no server at all. Or at least having not to worry about any server at all. There really is a server, it's just that the, the uh, back end provider provides it for you. <coughs> so if we put this all together, we will have a distributed, event driven. Everything is an event poking the system. Serverless, data flow, because the data is flowing through the system. Computing model, and it covers batch, queues, streaming, and it is going to support high performance computing enhanced function as a service. It will need parallel, distributed. In the olden days, distributed was grid computing. Uh, both of these ideas, and it will go from what I call pleasingly parallel, largely independent events. It will manage data, and it will do giant machine learning applications, hyperscale applications on large clusters. That's it. All right, as we will see, public clouds have gone from disruptive to just what everybody uses. And soon you'll be criticized for not using them, rather than for using them. And as I mentioned, they're becoming diverse. GPUs, FPGAs, high-speed networks, high-speed storage, lots of memory, little memory, so on. There's lots of software stacks. Software is all over the place. And there's the high-performance computing 
software stack, which is um, parallel computing oriented. It's less used because there's less parallel computing than big data computing. And the big data is dominated by what I call Apache uh, software stack, um, which has sent, which supports uh, centralized and edge computing, streaming data, and batch data. Um, and the big data, which will need high, hyperscale computing or high performance computing. And we'll have to have service oriented architectures, which we will discuss in these lectures. We will have to support the Internet of Things and edge computing. And the latter edge computing, which is roughly the same as Internet of Things as far as we're concerned, will actually grow in importance. And you will find all communities fighting this out. Database, distributed computing, systems people, parallel computing, machine learning, computational science, data science, data engineering, dot, dot, dot. And they will investigate the same or similar ideas. They won't actually talk to each other much because they come from different uh, universities or institutions or or they graduated at different times because some field, some areas are come and go. So anyway, the requirements are not very well explained by people because people just do things. They don't actually do what you're meant to do in systems engineering. Identify the requirements. Okay. All right, so we will need lots of computers, and we have lots of computers. And Intel changed the bulk, the uh, uh, way people thought about this in around 2008, which is here, when they stopped increasing the clock speed because the heat chips were melting. A very sad thing. And they went from a so the performance increase, which went like the uh, uh, cube of one over the fe feature size. So as you uh, decrease the feature size, you got a, a third power of the of that in your performance increase. One of those powers, the one coming to improving the clock speed because distances were shorter, uh, went away because you couldn't keep increasing the clock speed, and you have a performance which was. Uh, which was gotten increased by, because you had more area, you were able to put more cores, more computers fitted in the same area. And so you had to do parallel computing. So we need cores per chip, and chips, and chips per job. And when you discuss parallel computing, we note this issue of whether you have lots of systems, cores and chips uh, solving a problem, or just one running faster. It's the difference between Superman and or Superwoman uh, versus a bunch of people, society. All right. What is a cloud? Well, it's a bunch of computers, fifty thousand maybe, in one place. That place, the data center, is incredibly efficient uh, because it's optimally designed. Because it's so big, you can put a lot of effort into its design. And it's connected to the internet very fast because there are all these people typing their tweets away, and those tweets are rushing off to the cloud to be stored and spread out to the people's friends. And uh, they were produced uh, what used to be called Web 2.0. I don't think that term is used so much anymore because it's uh, advanced so much. What you might call e-commerce or social networking or search, public-facing sites. But if you look at modern clouds, they're actually a little more like old clusters, which tended to be internally very high performance, not externally. Because the traditional cluster did not have lots of people accessing it. Uh, so it had now the new uh, high HPC cloud will have high performance networks, high performance CPU, dot, dot, dot. And, but always a cloud can be just thought of as the optimal giant data center connected very well to the internet. One can actually have public clouds, which are sitting there with everybody accessing them, or private clouds with the same technology, the same largest size, but they're focused on a large organization, your serial manufacturing system, um, company, and so on. All right, 
Here is a little picture of the difference between clouds and traditional approaches. In clouds are elastic and on demand. And so this is shown in this graph here, contrasting a sort of traditional approach, server provisioning, the cloud provisioning, and we have this sort of um, load here, which is shown probably best here. Goes up and down. And what you have here is the, the here's the computers trying to track it, and you see they're not doing a very good job, and they they are either under it or over it in this site here. Here they have too many computers. Here they're too few. But over here, the cloud is much more uh, nimble and dynamic. It uh, is uh, bringing uh, servers online dynamically. That's called elasticity. Elasticity is a key feature of modern clouds. So in this case here, you'll find the number of servers and the load, they essentially match. And that is meant to be how clouds are operated. And to keep things comfortable, they actually are slightly over-provisioned most of the time. All right, here's a picture. Uh, this is some Google data center in Oregon, and it's uh, larger than the football field. Ten times larger than the football field. That's what this shows, shows here. Here, ten times larger than the football field. And here we have uh, a contrast of why clouds are cost effective. This is the component of the data center, storage. Network administration, server systems administration. Here is the cost in a small and a large data center, and it's somewhere between five and seven to one. Not surprising. Efficiency of scale, that's a well known feature of the world. And um, they use lots of power, but so they place it in a place like uh, uh, Columbia River where there's hydroelectric power, which is relatively cheap and green. So you save money by large size, positioning with cheap power, and making it so you have great access to the internet. NIST produced a, a set of characteristic features of clouds. They have a, a large cloud working group. I actually was working on the big data working group, but uh, there is also actually a better known cloud working group. So here we have on demand, elasticity. When your load goes up, the computers go up. We have shared resources, that's research pooling. We have this broad network access. Uh, resource allocation is highly flexible, on demand. And also you pay for what you use, measured service. You don't, if I buy a cluster, I pay for that cluster whether or not I'm using it. And <clears throat> this has economies of scale, which we stressed in the last couple of slides, and economy of, of green and green, green, uh, features because it uh, uses the best, it can use the best possible power. We have these wonderful new software models we'll see, uh, which is past concepts such as platform as a service, which is a value added to infrastructure as a service. The original clouds provided hardware on the market. You wrote your, got out your credit card and purchase time on a piece of, uh, a piece of iron, a computer. But now you can purchase time on your platform, on your software. And you can see in front of you this wonderful GUI with all these software capabilities you can drag and drop in your program. And often or typically they're cheaper than the old approach because the old approaches tend not to be used efficiently. All right, now we will have a look. We have a few slides on virtualization coming up, but. Virtualization has several features that are interesting. It's an abstraction, which means you run a job and it just runs. You don't know where it runs or what it runs on or things like that. All you know is it runs and a little message runs up the internet to the job, and then it runs down the job to you, the results. Uh, technically, virtualization means you use a hypervisor, which we'll discuss briefly, which support images. Images are the your a package which is your software, possibly with the operating system included. And then you have a complete job, which is the image, which is either has the output thing added or it's already built into the image. P 
flash your, your own software, and you can save that image and rerun it. And then we efficiently pack lots of applications into one server. That's because we need to use all those cores. We don't want those cores idle unless they really, if they ran, they would interfere with the operation of the other cores. We try to use as many cores as efficient. And so um, there will be interference. That means that the performance can be unreliable. It's not guaranteed. And whereas if you own your cluster, put your job on it, you know what you're going to get. And we need to be worried about security, and virtual machines have features in them which tend to make them more uh, robust security than otherwise. Here's an old cloud, uh, cloud use case. Uh, this was from the beginning of time when I first taught about clouds. It's a, a Old Microsoft publication, they were looking at a data center which had 5,000 SQL servers running, and the CPUs are 9.75% utilized. That's because that's the old way of packaging uh, was very inefficient. So you just repackaged everything as virtual machines and plonked down these images, and the images automatically relocated to idle cores. And you did the same computing with six times fewer servers, because you were able to use multi multi jobs on the same server. And that's of course a lot of money saved. In this case here, you saved about ten million dollars a year. Pretty good. Uh, here's a tri an even more specific example from Google, a game from the past, uh, where we were looking at Gmail compared to. What we used to have, we used to run our own um, email server. Now, Gmail is actually better than my own email server, so I shouldn't run my own email server. But that wasn't true at the beginning of time when we were doing this. Uh, but also, the, a small email server is just much less efficient. And here's uh, this thing showing us we increase the number of users. Uh, it, it gets more efficient to run, it costs less money. It's green, more green, and there's um, less systems admin, less, less everything. It's just much better. And plus, the software is probably better. Gmail is difficult to compete with the modern software systems, Hotmail, Gmail, what have you. All right. Then, of course, there's elasticity, which means that, I mean, so that was the beginning of clouds. Amazon noticed that they were had a giant set of computers to run their e-commerce site, and they weren't always being used because people were, you had to have enough computers to cope with Mother's Day, and so what do you do with those computers when it's not Mother's Day? So you rent those machines, and that was Amazon's incredibly brilliant and in retrospect simple idea. And as we will see, they actually make more money from renting their computers than using them. And then we have to use virtualization to efficiently use these computers doing packing and also to get good security. Um, there were so many of these computers because Amazon's e-commerce operation was so big and the future clouds were also built big, so you can get elasticity. If you have a small system, you can't really easily make it elastic. There's just not enough computers there to be elastic. And uh, dynamically double the number of computers you're using on a job. And that assumes, which is true, that the hardware is actually quite cheap. People are what's expensive, and you can keep some of them um, in reserve. And I just note the 10% reserve on 100,000 servers, a couple of cloud data centers is 10,000 servers, quite a lot spare. Exactly how you do this spareness and reserve and elasticity is a proprietary secret. Whether you switch them off or have them in a low pass state and whether you, they're loaded with software or not is not known. You actually probably do all of the above, because you want a hierarchical system which switches on uh, very, very quickly for some small jobs, and switches on less quickly for large elastic changes. And this I mentioned already earlier, that uh, some aspects of this field are difficult, because they're locked in these giant companies which are making them a huge amount of money, and they're not going to tell you how they do it. So, um, but anyway, we I already mentioned these two states. 
if you switch them off, you can't switch them on very quickly. So you tend to probably have at least some of them in idle state, but switched on. That is sort of the uh, actually critical for the serverless computing model, which is meant to have these capabilities hidden. And then an event pops in, uh, which is function as a service, and then invokes a function. That function is sitting there, sleeping around away, and then bounds into action. 